is we have, there we go. Thank you, Jonathan. We have um, a full program today and we wanna make sure and stick to our agenda. So I'm gonna kick us off, even though I think there'll still be folks coming in from the waiting room. So welcome and thank you all for joining us for our rendezvous this evening. This is our annual meeting and we're celebrating Park County Environmental Council's 32 years of conservation here in Yellowstone's Northern Gateway. So thank you for being here. Uh, my name's Michelle Yubaraga, and I have had the absolute pleasure of serving as PCEC's Executive Director since 2015. I'm joined today by many folks um, here and uh, a community superstar, and fellow Warrior for the Wild, Adele Welch, will be uh, your co-host with me tonight. I'm gonna start us off and kick us off with a quick introduction to our work and then pass to Adele to tell you a little bit more about what we have in store for the evening. So first, our mission is to work with the people of Park County to safeguard our communities, the Yellowstone River, our vast and wild public lands and the wild animals that inhabit them. We do this through grassroots advocacy, community organizing, and education. We have the privilege of living in an incredible place at the headwaters of the Yellowstone River. We're surrounded by unparalleled wild beauty. And this is the traditional homelands of the Apsalaka or the Crow tribe and many indigenous people that consider Yellowstone part of their traditional homelands, including Yellowstone's Tukadeka, which is a band of the Shoshone tribe and many more. So what is Park County today has a long tradition of human habitation, people who have loved, cherished, and stewarded this place, and that's a legacy we want to continue. So thank you for being here. Um, I want to acknowledge maybe we're all a bit tired of Zoom, so I promise that we uh, have a fun in-person member gathering coming in December. Uh, over the time that I've been with at PCEC, these Zooms or these membership meetings have been backyard barbecues, potlucks sit down dinners, now Zooms, and we're really would love to hear from you all and what you think we should do next year. Perhaps folks really like the Zoom and um, we can come up with other ways to get together in person. So I'm going to start, we're a growing team and I want to, a growing organization, I want to introduce um, our staff. So and I ask the staff to come off and just say hi so you can see everybody's face. So first, um, Jonathan Hedinger is our communications director. Hello. <laughs> Max, Max Yortsberg is our conservation director. Hi, everyone. Erica Lighthizer is our deputy director. Hi there. Robin Atticott serves as our operations director. Good evening. Carrie Kale is our business and community partnerships director. She is out of town getting some well-deserved rest. And Sarah Stans is our community resilience director. Hello. And we have a couple of new folks on the team this year. Um, can you move it to the next slide, Jonathan? I wanna welcome Bethany Allen. Bethany is our new landscape conservation specialist and she joined our team just this year working with a really great partnership um, at MSU Extension with other community partners to help landowners better understand invasive and noxious weed treatment in Park County. It's a really exciting program. We're really grateful to have her on our team. Can you say hi, Bethany? Hi, it's really great to be here and hope to work with folks more. And then we have another new addition to our team, Catherine Fazikas. Catherine joined us this summer. She's serving through AmeriCorps VISTA and she's also a PCEC Hayes Fellow. Um, Catherine works as a part of a cohort across the state. It's called a statewide resilience team. And they're working to both bolster and adapt as we change uh, as a state in the face of adversity. Catherine is working on a community resilience plan for Park County and we're so excited to have her. Can you say hi, Catherine? Hi everyone, thanks for being here. All right, and then I've got our board and I'm not gonna make the board 
um, say hi. I'm just going to acknowledge and recognize and thank them. We have an incredible board of directors that this is truly a working board that dedicate hours uh, of their personal time to help PCEC and we're incredibly grateful. So Wendy Riley, Sebring Davis, Lucinda Reinold, Kelly Niles, Joseph Dorn, Nelson King, Luis Islas, Karen Cochran, and Board Emeritus, Tom Murphy. Thank you all for everything you do all year long. We deeply appreciate you. Um, as part of our membership meeting, um, members have the opportunity to ratify and vote on our board. I sent that out in an email today and um, Jonathan's also gonna drop a chat in the, uh, or a link in the chat box so that you can click that and vote on our board. All right, now I'm gonna pass it over to Adele. She can tell you a bit more about what we have in store for the evening. Hi everyone, I'm so happy to be here with you today. Um, our theme of this year's annual meeting is celebrate community. Um, so we've dedicated our program this year to honoring PCEC volunteers. Our community has been through a lot in 2022. The rising waters of the Yellowstone River, washed out roads and flooded homes were just the icing on the disaster cake. We all know too many people, businesses and families that experienced immense hardship over the past several years who have lost loved ones, lost jobs and homes and closed businesses. Many folks are working on more than one job and just barely hanging on right now. The amazing thing though, is that through these hard times, people in our community came together and helped their friends and neighbors. We still have a lot of work to do to heal, but we are closer because of the individuals and volunteers that are committed to helping us get there. So tonight we wanna to recognize and thank them. We'll start by talking about the flood and tree volunteers and then give our Janet Shirey Spirit Award to a PCEC member. Wendy will share a financial report. Michelle will share some 2022 highlights and we'll end with a drawing of a day of fishing provided by Sweetwater Travel. Um, so please do stick around to the end to win. Um, and I'll pass back to Michelle for some introductions. Michelle, you're on mute. Thank you. That's funny because I'm in a very quiet house where I do not need to mute. Um, so I'm actually going to kick us off with some fundraising. So this is also uh, an opportunity for us to kick off our end of the year fundraising. And that's one of the purposes of our meeting tonight. Our goal this year is to raise $50,000 from now through January 1st. We've had some very generous donors who've agreed to match the first $10,000 that we raise within the next 24 hours. So you can help us by donating tonight. You can click on the donation link at our website to donate. Um, that link is also in the chat box and you can let us know if you wanna make a donation in the chat and we'll email you a link or you can do it the old fashioned way and call the office at 222-0723. We've got a great crew at the office and they're ready to help. To you, Robin. Robin seems to be on mute. Well, we've got, uh, Robin is in the office and we've got mugs and calendars and um, a really nice donation thermometer that's gonna track our progress throughout the night. So um, we'll stay tuned and check in back with them. Thank you so much to Remy and Silas who are now. <laughs> So we've got our thermometer here that we're going to, I've got Remy and Silas, our interns, you'll hear more from later, but I've got our thermometer to track our donations tonight. We have a, uh, a hefty goal of 10 grand, but I think we can do that. We're coming to the end of the year. We've got some really exciting goals to meet. So we're going to go ahead and continue this uh, coloring project back in the office while you guys are listening in. Um, for our $50 donations, we will make sure that you get a Tom Murphy calendar for 2023 which is some phenomenal pictures. I'm sure you, many of them are familiar with the calendars that we have throughout the years. And then we also have a selection for those donations, $100 and above, a selection of some hydroplast mugs 
that have the PCEC logo on them. All right, back to you. Thanks, Robin. Thank you so much. Um, Adele is going to introduce our first speakers for the night. Um, yes. The important work of community conversation uh, happens when local people work together to protect what they love and one another. Um, so on June 13th, as I'm sure you all are aware, on 2022, the water floodwaters rose on the Yellowstone River. Friends, neighbors, and local officials had to move quickly to avoid the worst case scenario and then wade through the waters to help one another. I'm going to invite Sarah Stans, um, our Community Resilience Director, to tell us more about the community flood response. Thank you, Adele. Um, can we move the slides ahead? I don't know. Thank you so much. Um, so it's so nice to see you, Adele, and joining us and everybody else in the room. Thank you for also honoring how hard this natural disaster has been and still is for a large part of our community. Um, yeah, some people are going to be building, rebuilding for years, picking up debris, um, and others may never recover. Um, and we're still learning a lot um, and about the flood's impacts to hopefully better prepare in the future. So looking back when I was a bit old, a bit younger actually than Adele um, during the record-breaking snowpack and 1996 and 1997 flooding events. Um, I was about to graduate high school and however this flood felt harder. Uh, perhaps it was because the water came faster or uh, perhaps it was because the last time the media and we were told that it was the kind of flood that we could only expect once in every century. And um, that's once in a lifetime event. And now 25 years later, um, experiencing it again in my lifetime. And so going forward, perhaps we need to start thinking about our efforts to protect erosion prone banks by not using riprap, uh, dikes and jetties. And perhaps we need a new vision for living with and alongside the Yellowstone River, especially with the changing climate. So five months following the June 13th flood, um, we had hundreds of individuals show up, bring food, pitch and fill sandbags. Many organizations pulled together to literally learn how to build the plane as we were flying it. Um, we were exhausted. Uh, for PCEC, it was all hands on deck. Um, we immediately stepped in to support whomever needed it uh, in communications, on the ground, coordinating. And our biggest thanks really goes to our members and community that just kept, sh kept showing up in any way possible, um, including Adele, who came into the office. I think she had a week in between school and heading off to be a raft guide. She would bring fresh break treats, and she spent hours on the phone coordinating volunteers and individuals. So together, we did a lot. We reached over uh, 300 willing volunteers, local and regional. We checked in on over 75% of the flood cases on crisis cleanup. We coordinated lot, nine large volunteer group days, um, over 40 cases and going to people's houses and businesses. We provided information on the ground to United Way and the Park County Community Foundation uh, Relief Fund. And we contributed in over 3000 in-kind hours in volunteer coordination and flood relief. So I'm gonna show a couple of photos if, um, just to get a sense of the flood work and what we, what we did. Um, keeping in mind, all these photos were taken in the day. So all the water levels in these first couple of photos, um, you can, uh, whoever's in charge, can you flip to the next one? So all the water levels, um, these are not its max height being that it peaked at night. Um, can you go on the next one? Um, so this picture shows how the water came in as a massive blanket, you know, through the forest. And, you know, this was a, it's not a before and after, it's actually a after and before um, because I took the second photo and how sandbags actually didn't help a lot of people at the end of the day, there was just so much water. You can flip to the next slide. When we went and knocked on door to door, um, this person um, really in true Montana spirit said they were fine. Do you have a next slide? Yeah, this person said that they were fine. They didn't need any help. Um, we asked if we could check their basement. It was full of water. We brought a sump pump. Um, we organized multiple volunteer days and cleaned up debris for days, hooked them up to United Way and uh, made sure that they got funding. You know, the lesson here was that without going to door to door, these folks weren't in the digital platforms and they would have fallen through the cracks um, if we just rely on those systems. 
So you can kind of scroll through the next few slides. This is just an example of the debris and the silt, um, the stuff that washed downstream, um, building materials, recliners. You can go to the next slide. Uh, broken fences, um, sheds that have moved and relocated themselves, and the amount, amazing amount of silt and trash that collected. You can go to the next slide. Um, lots of debris and trash intermingled. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this on your own properties. Um, it just did a lot of damage to some folks and other folks, it didn't. It was quite amazing. Um, you can go to the next slide. Gutted homes, more debris, you can go to the next slide. Um, some of the banks and boat launches um, following the days after the flood, next slide. These are just a couple of our groups. So we had, um, we had Day Spring Restoration, MSU Service Days, we had Montana Conservation Corps, uh, Bozeman Field School, Bridger Bowl, Greater Impact, and others um, just pitching in all the way until the end of October. You can go to the next slide. Um, we also cleaned up the levee sandbags and coordinated with the city and, and other partners um, and dumping all that sand and Army Corps of Engineers actually came and helped pitch in there too. You can go to the next slide. Go next slide. Uh, this was just two days of, of debris pickup on one person's property. And I've merged those two photos together um, just to show the immense amount of, um, of stuff that's kind of there lingering um, in the shadows out of sight. Okay, next slide. Oh, actually, why don't you go back because we'll just we'll just linger on this slide here. So I'm going to pass it over to one of our community members um, who was and was impacted heavily by the flood and longstanding PC supporter to share her story and what volunteers meant to her. Um, but before I do that, and um, it's with Frances Stewart and she's here in the room and thanks Frances for joining us. But before I do that, I want to personally honor a few individuals that really stood out uh, because they just kept showing up. Week after week, they did the hardest jobs, crawling into crawl spaces, um, doing jobs that Team Rubicon wouldn't do. They brought trailers, moved vulnerable people to new homes, and just kept checking in on people and would take a no job is too small approach. So not everyone wanted to be here, um, and that's okay, and they couldn't, and hopefully they're going to be there for December 8th as we can cook everybody some dinner. But Justin Feinberg, Steve Kleinberg, Nancy Perkins, Jim Earl, and Carrie Russell, um, we really couldn't have achieved what we did because of you. And just thank you for your continued spirit to show up. I'd also like to honor Emily, Emily, sorry, Ellie Parva, and she was the team lead for Montana Conservation Corps. She brought multiple teams and really got stuck in with us on the ground. And then last but definitely not least, and whom I award for community champion, this volunteer coordination piece is going to go to, um, is a woman that really stepped up during the flood to help her community. And we really couldn't have done um, what we did without her. And that's Emily Kemp. And I think she's in the room. If you're not, can you please, yeah, you put in your video, there she is. Um, Emily works in youth mental health and suicide prevention for the Jed Foundation and is a board member for Level 49. She stepped into volunteer, um, volunteer coordinators, and she was streamlining communications, compiling resources, attended and facilitated countless meetings. She did a massive volunteer outreach to the entire Park County 211 signup list. And she was nothing short of awesome. And our community has recovered so much faster because, um, because of her. And as a result, and I didn't know her before, and I just, Emily, I just want to give you this award as a standout community champion. And we can't thank you enough for your passion, huge heart. Um, and I'm really honored to have the opportunity to stand by your side. Um, and this, sorry, it's, the flag is really emotional. So, so thank you, um, Emily. Would you like to say a couple words <laughs> while I mute? Thank you, Emily. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sarah. Wow, I'm a little emotional too. Sorry. Also, of course, my dog has decided this moment to be super needy, so I'm gonna try and keep her keep her out of the frame here. Um, she, yeah, Sarah texted me said you have two to three minutes. I'm like, oh lord, I don't have two to three minutes of things to say. <laughs> um, but I just, yeah, I just, I guess for those of you who don't know how this relationship came to be, it really just happened because 
I feel like the Livingston community, as soon as the flood hit, like everyone stopped and everyone pivoted and everyone came together to offer whatever skills, talents, resources that they had. And it happened to be at a time because because I work with schools during the summer that it was a little bit slower for me. And so through some meetings in the community, um, an opportunity to partner with PCEC just sort of happened organically. And Sarah was instrumental in facilitating that relationship. I remember her calling me one afternoon being like, so you want to, you want to, you want to be my friend? You want to start working on this with me? And I was like, oh man, I was scared because it's a big job, but she made it so easy. And PCEC has been nothing but wonderful and supportive. And um, yeah, I mean, it just, it's just one of those things when the community needs help. I feel like we all have that as a common value. You just step up and do what needs to get done. And honestly, I feel like it's been an equally rewarding situation for me. I can honestly say that I've found like a, a really good friend in Sarah, which has been super fun to develop that friendship and relationship. So it's not all selfless, like a very, very much some selfish, selfish motives there. I'm, I'm getting just as much out of partnering with PCEC and making awesome friends and feeling like I'm helping the community. Um, yeah, that, that's about it. Thanks for letting me jump in and hang out. Thank you, Emily. It means so much that you're here. So we really appreciate you. And it's been incredible getting to know you. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Frances Stewart. Uh, she's a longtime PCEC supporter, community member. Um, and I just wanted her to provide some space to share anything she wanted to about the flood and what it meant, meant to her. Frances. Thanks, Hera. Well, um, here I am in my home on 9th Street Island. Uh, so, you know, I pretty much had a front row seat for this flood because this cabin I'm in is 30 feet from the river. And um, amazingly, water did not get in the house, but it was sure close. Did get in the crawl space like everyone. And um, so I was a pretty much in shock from the 12th of June, seeing the, the gardens and the yard and everything as green as it's ever been. And then coming back on the 14th and seeing everything that used to be green gray and just mounds of that awful mud, which turned to the awful silt. And uh, we just, we just breathed it, lived it for, I, I, I don't remember time. I just know every day was crisis management from the time I woke up to the time I went to bed for months and months way into September. And a lot of people don't realize it, me included, uh, like the people that said, oh, we're fine. I mean, uh, you you don't know really what the extent of the damage is for months and months after an event like this. And so um, yeah, it, it just takes staying with it and staying with it. And, uh, you know, that's what PCEC did. The thing that amazed me was, I mean, we had been sandbagging from the beginning and it was, uh, you know, before the flood, but we were just hearing about what was coming down because the gauges had all watched out. So we didn't know how much water was coming and how fast it was going to come. But, you know, um, uh, it was just neighbors, including uh, Bill Zanoni and all of the Zanoni Ubaraga clan, which as we all know is pretty extensive. Thank goodness for all of them, even Luca. Um, but then, you know, after it happened, we were still sandbagging because the, the, the erosion was happening as because the river stayed so high for so long. So you couldn't really dry out a crawl space until the river went down, which was months later. I lost a big cottonwood tree on July 4th. So that it was still eroding and eating away, doing damage pretty much all through the summer. And um I the the what the thing I noticed um, immediately was that the uh the agencies uh, the city, the county, the state, and the federal agencies really were not, our local agencies weren't equipped to deal with this. And so not no network to find out what's wrong, what's happening. And PCEC was the one that picked up the ball and created this network, you know, and, it, and right, it was, it took them a little while to get it going. I have to say, um, uh, shout out to Erica Lighthouser, who was making calls even when she had COVID. And she said, I wish I had come in person, but I've got COVID, but I'm going to still do the phone calls. And uh, 
I think it, it got better and better as we got on as we, you know, but I was right there saying uh, yes to anybody that volunteered to come. And, and uh, the, 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 who, that crisis team you mentioned too, I think Sarah, that, that showed up in the beginning did look around the volunteers. I can't remember the name. I think they were kind of organized at the, at the state events from the state, but they said, you know, yeah, you need to clean out that crawl space, clean out that crawl space. First thing you need to do, but you know, we don't do that. <laughs> Somebody else came by and said, oh yeah, you got to clean out that crawl space. You got to get everything out right away. So you don't have mold, but we don't do that. So here comes from Bozeman, Justin Feinberg, who, you know, I said, well, he's got to be, a, you know, a, a, some kind of construction worker because Justin said, I'll go down there. You know, he put his hat on backwards and said, can I take my tunes? And I said, sure. So we had Grateful Dead cranking and he pulled out stuff that had been in that crawl space since construction in the 60s. Things we didn't even know what they were, but, you know, plumbers had left pipe, you know, it was all kind of stuff. He hauled it out and, and uh, Steve Kleinberg, would would have gone down, but he came when he was sick, assured everyone it was not COVID, but he's, you could tell he was weak. It was some big cold he had, but Steve and I were picking up the stuff as Justin was pushing it up out of the crawl space, throwing it into Shiloh Hernandez, big old truck and uh, hauling loads to the flood dump, which, you know, I really hated to see and hated to do, but that's the problem. When you have something like this, all of this goes into the ground, but, uh, Justin was in there. I gave him this big construction N95 mask I had and told him, you have to use this. You have to wear this, in which he would have, I think. But of course, he doesn't want, I'm, I'm surprised, I'm not surprised that he isn't here because he doesn't want recognition, but he was amazing. And he even kept up, texted me to see how I was doing and stopped in one time, going down to somebody else you know, a month later, who somebody else down the island, and a single woman who lived alone, who really was too much in shock to get on, on it. And so by the time she did, she was in real trouble. And Justin went down and helped her. But he stopped in on the way to see how I was doing. And I was, of course, in much better shape. Thanks to him and all the volunteers, They, you know, the crews that came from all over the place. And um, uh, the other person, uh, the other two women that came early on were Nancy Perkins and Carrie Russell. And I was just sort of standing there in uh, in what used to be these raised beds and gardens and just, you know, with the flood dump shovels that we'd been donated, you know, at, the, at, the, at Civic Center and just going, wow. And they just picked them up and started shoveling. And so I said, well, okay, this is how we do this. Until I realized it was what they just worked and worked and worked until we realized it was too much. And I eventually ended up just taking it all out and uh, planting grass because it was really too much to, to shovel out. But it was heavy, awful stuff. And they still worked and worked on that. Uh, both of them were pulling up fence and pulling out debris and grass. And, uh, you know, uh, I was just amazed at how hard people would work for so many hours for people I didn't even know. And um, uh, I, I could never have cleaned this place up if it hadn't been for the PCEC volunteers and Pastor Daryl and all the uh, church volunteers that showed up from Alabama and Mississippi and all the people he brought in. And, uh, you know, really the people that were the volunteers like that were the ones who really did the hard work. Um, I hope it shows the agencies and officials of our city and county and state that we need uh, we need a network that can res a response network that can happen right away when disasters occur um but thank you pcc for stepping into the void and figuring it out we were all just got doing this as we go along it's like we'll shovel no this isn't going to work okay we'll do this we'll do this we were all pivoting you know every day but i I was just um, uh, in tears, really, just of joy and appreciation for the for the way people helped each other. So, so thank you all. And um, we're still you, dealing with it. Now we're dealing with bank restoration. This is the yeah. nightmare that doesn't go away. <laughs> we're just trying to, you know, hope before the next big mega flood, we can uh, be better prepared. 
We so, will have, and we will have December 8th. We're going to have more space to celebrate all of our volunteers and have more stories. Thank you, Francis, for showing up. And um, Adele, I'm going to pass it back to you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, thank you Sarah, Emily, Francis. Thank you guys so much. Um, wonderful to hear your stories. Um, I'd like to welcome PCEC's Deputy Director, Erica Lighthizer, um, and the TREE team to talk about our work with Livingston Loves Trees. Right on. Hi, everyone. I have the privilege tonight of talking to you about Livingston Loves Trees. It's a really special new initiative and partnership between PCEC and an absolutely fabulous group of local volunteers called the TREE Team, or that's what we have dubbed ourselves. Um, I think it's a really inspiring example of what can be accomplished in our community when a passionate group of volunteers comes together and organizes around an issue they care about. So instead of talking at you myself this evening, I'd love to introduce my friend Susan, who's kind of serves as our fearless leader on the TREE team, and I'd like to have her come and talk a little bit more about the program. Susan, are you uh, where you can um, pop up here so I can mute? Hi, all good. <laughs> okay, I'm Susan Regal, and um, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to talk to you tonight briefly about um, Livingston Loves Trees, because we're sort of the new kid on the block at PCEC, and um, and I, it's just good to be able to share what we've been up to. So can we go to the next slide? Um, so. It really all got started, as Erica was saying, when uh, there was really a, a small group of, of local citizens who got together with PCEC to start a tree planting campaign. And by tree planting campaign, what I really mean is it's a, it's a tree planting, growing, nurturing campaign. And um, we have a serious, but really, I think, very joyful mission, which is to plant diverse and hardy trees. Whoops, let's go back. <laughs> um, to plant diverse and hardy trees in boulevards, parks, and public spaces to revitalize Livingston's community forest and improve its resiliency. So that's that's what we're all about. Um, and these are just some pictures of planting um, the team and Erica, Erica, who was amazing, um, and. Uh, and just, it was just a great experience in our first year of planting. So go to the next slide, if you would. Um, so just really, really briefly, the, the benefits of planting trees. Well, um, there's a lot of them. I think most of us have them in our heads, but uh, one of them is beauty, that trees just add so much appeal to our community. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's just hard to even measure what they give to our streets and parks and downtown um shade <laughs> cooling shade in the summertime which is great and as someone who lives um on the hill one of my favorites actually that's not on here is uh they make excellent excellent uh, wind um breaks you know <laughs> wind shields and so that's very important they clean the air you know that's rather nice they keep our air fresh and clean they um provide wildlife habitat for birds and other wildlife and um if we keep in mind when we're planting that we want a diversity of trees, which is really key here. They're the best defense against invasive pests. So if you go to the next slide, um, we do have some challenges, including invasive pests and some other challenges. Um, the invasive pest hasn't invaded yet, but we'll get to that. So um, we have an aging tree population and uh, the, the trees in some ways that you could say that was sort of advantageous in the sense that we have big, beautiful, you know, older trees in our town, but we also are losing them to attrition and other factors. and. Um, and they're just not as hardy or sturdy in our winds. And so what we end up with is really sort of tree deserts on different blocks where the trees are no longer on the boulevards and you know they disappeared from the boulevards and there really aren't trees. So trees are needed on, in areas of our public um, spaces. Uh, we have um, you know a serious lack of diversity. I think whoever planted these trees long ago, uh, ash trees were very much the thing. And so we have, uh, uh, it, it just makes us very vulnerable when there are things like invasive pests that if, if uh, one type of tree dominates, 
in our case, we have, I think of the 4,000, estimated 4,000 trees in our community, we have uh, about 50% are green ash, which are uh, very vulnerable um, to the uh, emerald ash borer, the lovely fellow that you can see on the screen. Um, and this emerald ash borer um, has basically I think it came, I'm not sure what, I think it was maybe 2002 that it first appeared in the Midwest and that the consensus is that it probably came in on wood packing materials. It is a definitely an invasive beetle species and it loves um, ash trees and it destroys ash trees. So it's been spreading across the country now for quite a while, a slow, steady pace. A devastating trees as it went um, as it goes and it's killed literally to kill hundreds of millions of ash trees in its way it's it's destroyed ash populations in a lot of communities, so it, it may not get here for a while, but um, it probably will get here and it's something that we all need to think about I think people do think about it, and I think it was one of the real driving points that got our tree team going um, so. So one thing that we can do, we, it's hard to really stop this uh, from happening, uh, but we do, we are lucky to have uh, the Livingston Tree Board and working with the city to try to mitigate to the loss of trees, but we will lose trees. And for that reason, now is the time to be planting a lot of young trees so that our, um, our boulevards and parks never lose their green. Um, so that's a very, a big part of what we're trying to do. Um, so what have we actually accomplished? I'm going to take a sip of water here. Um, what have we actually accomplished so far? Well, 2022 was our first year of planting. And we planted 64 um, really great, hardy, diverse trees all over town. Um, and we originally said, oh, let's try to plant 25 trees. And then it was like, let's try to plant 50 trees. And we were really thrilled that the town responded and that we were able to raise the funds to plant 64 trees. And it was a, a great year and a great learning experience for all of us. Um, and so uh, we were able to uh, reach people through uh, adopt a tree program that we launched. The adopt a tree program, what it is, is that uh, for city residents who uh, want a tree on their boulevard and have space for a tree, uh, they can sign up to get a, a free tree, and these are really great, you know, trees you can see in the pictures. Um, uh, they can sign up to get a tree and have it planted for them if they commit to watering and caring for it. And that last part is a, is a huge piece of it because we need um, we need people to care for the trees. Yes, and and so we make a big point about that. Um, so uh, we we planted those trees, and then we didn't just walk away. Uh, we definitely um, have tried very hard to keep in touch with people. Uh, Tom Shans on the, who's on the tree board, but he's also a member of our uh, committee, our our team, I should say. Um, he wrote a, a tree guide for like summer watering guide that we distributed to all the people who got trees from us, um, and we have we monitor the trees we keep an eye on the trees tom is particularly good about keeping an eye on the trees so we know what's going on with them um and if it's really hot dry weather we text people and get all kinds of responses from people um about yes i'm on it <laughs> i'm gonna water the trees um and then i think we just sent out a winter watering guide because we have this um in winters now because of climate changing climate um, we have this kind of ping pong effect where it's um you know it's very cold and then we get mild weather which is very hard on trees and so we've been trying to prepare people for uh what they can do to keep their trees all their trees and these trees their new trees healthy and um so that's that's really been rewarding for us to be working really monitoring the tree recipients um and then we've also focused on the areas of greatest need. So there's certain neighborhoods we, we are trying to work on this with the, the tree board and also just our observations and sending people around. We have we've just started sending people around on the team to check out different areas of the city and really kind of create a map um, along with some of the surveys that have been done by the city 
of where are the where are the greatest needs, and we kind of set aside tree, um, trees to go to those areas, and we also actually go door to door and put door hangers on doorknobs so that everyone will say yes. You know, it's it's been very effective, but um, so that people in those neighborhoods know that they can get trees. Um, so um, I, I am I am very pleased to say that as of fall going into winter of the trees we planted, um, the vast majority of them seem to be doing great. Okay, we could go to the next slide. So, so what is up ahead? Um, well, we, based on the, the response of the community um, and uh, really the success of this, this first planting, we have a new goal to plant a thousand trees, a thousand hardy, beautiful trees in Livingston over the next 10 years. And you can just imagine, um, you know how much impact that could have uh, we're pacing ourselves just over 10 years we're trying to do 100 trees a year um, and we would really invite people in the community to join us so there's a lot of ways you can join us you can, you can make um, financial donations which is great and to make donations specifically to the tree team um, the tree fund you can go to the pcc site and go to livingston loves trees um, and the pc PC Easy has set it up so that um, it's a restricted fund, so all the money goes for trees and care of trees. Um, that's always very helpful, but it's also we're a fun, we're a hardworking team, but we're a fun team to be a part of, and it's really rewarding work to volunteer to actually take part in planting and take part in other um, activities and. Um, and one of the things that's so rewarding about it is that it's the results are so tangible. We, like we all talked about that when we were planting trees. That you're standing there with this beautiful tree, and you just did that, and um, so that's it's it's really very rewarding. Um, another thing is you can adopt a tree, and as it happens, the adopt a tree uh, sign up period is opening tonight. <laughs> So ta da da, <laughs> and um, so to adopt a tree, you again go to the PCC website, and um, when you go to the Livingston Loves Trees page, there is a spot place where you can um, sign up to get a tree, and it is a uh, first come first serve basis, and we do have to we do a lot of have checking and making sure that you have space and all kinds of surveys that have to go on, but. But really, it's been most people who tried to get a tree have gotten a tree and have been really happy with them. And um, so keep that in mind when you go home tonight, take a good hard look at your boulevard. And if there's a space there, you can help us grow a Livingston's um, uh, city forest. So I just want to close by saying a couple things. One, I want to thank I want to thank PCEC for, you know, just taking us on and and um, doing so much um, really within the community to um, support trees and growing our trees and keeping our community beautiful um, and strong. And the volunteers, I wish I could thank everyone because we have amazing volunteers who just um, have been so great. Uh, we also have a lot of support from the, uh, the uh, landscaping community who we get all our trees locally and they've just been wonderful as well. And what I hope we can do is maybe put some profiles up on the, page, the, the tree page eventually just so that the people who are doing so much to make this all possible can um, you know get their due but um, really thanks to, to all our volunteers so much um, and then I just wanted to close by saying that when we're out planting trees one of the things we think about is that what we're doing the trees we're planting some of which have life uh, life expectancies of two to three hundred years um, they have to get through, but you know, when they do, it's possible that two, three hundred years from now, people who are living in Livingston are going to be standing in the shade of, under some of the trees that we plant, and it it just gives you such a good feeling about that. That what we're doing, someone planted all these trees that we love, and in our parks and boulevards and public places now, years ago, and it's meant so much to us, and that we're doing the same for the future generations. So, thank you very much, and. Um, Thank you, PCEC. Thank you, Susan. Um, thank you to the tree team. Thank you, Erica. Um, just quickly gonna say we are having donations come in. Thank you so much. I think we're at $1,000 right now. We've got a $10,000 match. So don't forget to grab the uh, link in the chat. 
make a phone call 222-0723 and help us reach our goal. Um, I'm going to pass to Max Yortsberg um, to talk about our Janet Shirey Spirit Award next. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, everyone, for those presentations. It's it's my pleasure to um, award the Janet Shirey Spirit Award. I have it here with me now. Um, this award was named after uh, Janet Shirey. I don't, some of you on the meeting today may have known her. She lived in Paradise Valley for a long time. Um, I was really good friends with her son, so I got to know her. She was in very many ways, a firebrand. She spoke her mind. Uh, she didn't suffer fools once. Um, and she was a fierce advocate for conservation and, and protecting uh, Paradise Valley and Park County. Um, and we've given this award every year. Um, and I, when I look at the, the names on this plaque, I think she would have enjoyed meeting um, every single one of them. Unfortunately, Janet passed away about uh, 10, 15 years ago. So this is in her honor. And this year, um, the award goes to a dear friend of PCEC's, Jeff Reed. Um, I could go on and on and on about Jeff. I've known him for quite a long time. I've worked with him on many projects, past and present. But I'd like to ask Wendy Weaver, the director of Montana Freshwater Partners, to uh, share a little bit about Jeff before um, we hand this award off to him. Uh, Wendy and Freshwater Partners are, are you know, invaluable help and, and, and strong advocates with us on our water resource work. And so uh, we all work with Jeff on, on that with the Upper Yellowstone Watershed Group. So Wendy, I'll hand it off to you if uh, I think you're still on the line. Yeah, thanks, Max. And I also want to thank PCEC uh, for being such a great partner in our watershed work. I'm truly grateful. And, and it's an honor to be able to get to speak about Jeff and working with him. I don't see him on here, but it's hard to see. But we've been working with Jeff for probably five years. And I guess what I have to say is that I'm truly grateful and appreciative that all he has done for the watershed group when this really began after the 2016 fish kill. We brought uh, a number of different stakeholders and partners together to figure out how to address issues that the Yellowstone is face facing um, when we really didn't see a lot of work happening. And, and Jeff, through that effort, really stepped up to the plate and created the structure for us to really uh, talk about different uh, issues that are facing Yellowstone River. And what I can say is that he's been critical for essentially keeping the wheels on the bus with that effort um, and coordinating and, and really providing the backbone uh, in which a lot of the discussions have happened and really putting the, the resource, the river first and foremost in those efforts. And he is responsible for creating the website and maintaining it and navigating all the complexities of working in Paradise Valley and Park County, as many of you are probably aware. We're a really challenging place to do this type of conservation work. And he's just really stepped up to the plate and he's been inclusive. He holds people accountable. And Jeff, I just cannot thank you enough for all that you've done as a volunteer, done this on your own uh, time uh, to put the website and keep the Fish, Wildlife and Rec Committee going. So anyway, on behalf of the Watershed Group and, and those in that committee, uh, thank you for all that you've done. And it sounds like this award's a perfect fit for you. Yeah. And Jeff, when 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 I see you next in person, I'll have to get a picture with you holding up the <laughs> award itself since we can't do it right now. Thank you, uh, Max and Wendy, the ragamuffins that you are, and dear friends. Um, what an honor. Um, Jonathan, why don't you just drive this? Um, thanks for just letting me speak for a few minutes. Uh, hopefully, this is inspirational for people. Um, 
And I just wanted to share with you a few thoughts. Um, obviously, I share this award with a ton of people um, who preserve wildness, such as this beautiful girl staring at us on the screen uh, that I took a photo of. Over the last year, even in these divisive times, I've noticed that no one truly hates wildlife. Uh, even some of my fiercest wolf hater friends in the journey I took last year with Wild Livelihoods, um, who, and these folks often know more about wildlife than many people, they admit that they don't, you know, actually hate uh, wildlife. So this quote from Ellie Wiesel um, means a lot to me. Love of nature is likely a universal human trait. I mean, who doesn't like open spaces, running water and, and wildlife in spite of fires, floods and conflict? Um, many of us on this call were blessed to grow up here hiking everywhere in the greater Yellowstone. But if I were honest with everybody, um, I wasn't necessarily an animal lover per se in my youth. I didn't hate them. Um, but the honest truth is that I was indifferent. Uh, so now every day I wake up, I read this quote just to remind me that just because I don't hate something doesn't mean that I truly love it. Um, this next photo for me is the definition of indifference. Um, it is something that's on our mind locally lately. It's caption could read how to love something to death. <laughs> this next photo um, is really what inspired me to get into conservation work. And it's done by some, based on some research by Arthur Middleton and others. And it, raise your hand if you can see them. Um, Look really closely, kind of in the middle. Jonathan, show them where they're at. See them right there? That's a herd of a small group of elk climbing the Absorki Mountains on their annual migration to the wintering grounds. I mean, tell me that's not insane. And it's no wonder that people love nature, right? And they spend half a billion dollars annually in Park County to see it. This next map is from that same study and you've probably seen it before. It represents the beating arteries of several elk migrations in the greater Yellowstone. And here we sit um, in this land we call paradise. This next map is an area you might not have seen. It's called the Yellowstone Pronghorn Project. Show them this next map, Jonathan. It's a decade long effort to recover our dwindling numbers of local pronghorn and first peoples used to hunt them in droves around here. There are rock corrals, not but a mile from where I'm sitting on the landscape to prove it. And we only have three subherds now in you know, Livingston to Gardner, and one of them partly due to pronghorn being displaced from Bozeman. And since I dabbled my toes in this project, I refused to be indifferent anymore. But what's weird is I didn't really feel like I was in love. Um, in fact, I was getting pretty burned out a couple of years ago. I'd find myself reading Ed Abbey books with a bottle of whiskey, bitching about how the world was falling apart. And um, which I still think it is, by the way. And Michelle probably got a few drunken texts from me during that period telling her to do more and we should all do more. Uh, but this this next map on the right that, that really changed me. And this is a map of pronghorn collar data from a herd north of immigrant. And the lines basically show where they're wandering around in their turf. But in the bottom left corner, you'll see a faint green line which represents one female pronghorn leaving the herd to give birth near our farm alongside the Yellowstone River. It's the first time I've seen them do that in my 45 years of living here. And that fake green line has become my pale blue dot in essence. Um, and John, if you go to the next slide, this is the carcass of that mother two days after giving birth. Uh, she was killed by a vehicle which basically left behind her and scattered parts of a car on Highway 89. And obviously, I was heartsick. I had watched her diligently for three days, including the day she gave birth. 
And this next picture uh, are the fawns a few days later. And they're the two little speck dots on the horizon in the distance in my binoculars. And one of them is actually trying to suckle on the other in 99 degree June weather, both of them waiting for their mother who wouldn't come back. So I did what I thought was the right thing. I crawled through the dirt and cactus to get close enough to euthanize them. But before I did that, I sat silently about two yards away, watching their black tongues panting in the heat and their beautiful elephant-sized eyes blinking in the sun. And I did that for about a half hour before they took their last breath. And whether I did the right thing or not is beside the point. My point is that I had finally engaged with wildlife at a very personal level. I had engaged in their world and I had seen it from their eyes. I've hunted my entire life, including pronghorn, and I knew a few things about wildlife. But I often tell my friends in the words of Norman McLean that I hadn't yet started to think like a pronghorn. And I definitely hadn't fallen in love with one, but I had then. And miraculously, from that point on, I no longer got burned out from conservation. And as I thought back on it, I learned that I could never really bear the burden or fight the headwinds um, that Sarah and others mentioned. I mean, it's, it's a brutal uphill battle, um, but I couldn't fight that burden unless I moved past this stage of indifference into this really painful, yet honest and truthful world of love. And, you know, whether you're an atheist who believes in biodiversity or you're a religious person who believes in being a responsible steward of all creation, and I would remind those folks that it's all creation in the Old Testament, you know, it's up to us, unfortunately, who will determine whether they have room to live here while we also live on the earth. And that, that includes cutthroat in the river or pronghorn on the landscape. And that's the only burden we must bear is whether we are indifferent or we love them. That mother came from the pronghorn herd who live and raise families north of immigrant, right where Montana's DNRC is seeking to put a gravel pit. Um, and again, thank you PCEC for helping coordinate local landowners and businesses and hunters and hikers uh, to fight this because our lifestyles and our livelihoods and dare I say, our private property values depend on open spaces and abundant wildlife. And not to mention just for the love of wildlife for their own sake. This next project is even on a grander scale and one that has few political opponents called Yellowstone Safe Passages. Uh, in terms of wildlife, it may be the BHAG of my lifetime. Um, it's something that would prove our love, for sure, and something you've no doubt heard about. It's an effort to bring wildlife crossings to Highway 89 and reduce vehicle collisions. And it directly is directly relevant to how wildlife moves through the migration arteries of our unique valley. And once again, thank you, PCEC, for supporting this project. Um, if we locals don't get engaged broadly, we won't get the support of the state and the feds um, to carry this project forward. Here's an email from FWP in response to my request asking why they recently removed Paradise Valley from their wildlife migration priority area. There's only two in the state. And regardless of a few flaws in their response, the closing statement is a healthy challenge for us all. I quote from the Wildlife Division Special Projects Coordinator, she said, in summary, it is our belief that further community organization and coordination is needed within the Paradise Valley. It is important to note that the likelihood of us prioritizing the area will increase if there are landowner and community supported project proposals ready for funding. She could have just said, we believe your community is indifferent. My email response was simple. We accept your challenge. I could have sat around and debated their claims, but I'm really less interested in being right. I'm more interested in actually winning this battle. What I love about PCEC is that they constantly remind me that to love something 
to protect it requires me to show up, as Michelle often says, to get my hands dirty, to put my money where my mouth is, to engage in all viewpoints while still making my case for my values. And perhaps more, most importantly for me, to do in my own backyard what I hope others will do in theirs. So thank you from the bottom of my heart, um, each of you working at PCC and Wendy and so many others for being there for me and all sorts of diverse stakeholders. But perhaps tonight for me, most importantly, for being a voice for the voiceless, um, like this little girl in front of us. I love you guys. I really do. Um, I'm not going to get emotional. You are true friends, totally. Kyrita, and thank you. Thank you so much for this honor. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was so inspirational. Sorry, Michelle, if you were about to no, say something. That's, I just said, interjecting a heartfelt <laughs> thank you to Jeff, please, Adele. Yeah. It, is, it is your, I just, <laughs> it was a beautiful presentation. Thank you, Jeff. Truly really beautiful. Yeah, thank you so much um, to you and congratulations to all of the volunteers. And yes, do put your money where your mouth is. We still have like 9,000, no, 7,000 more dollars to go. So go donate at that link. Um, but one of PCEC's missions is to build conservation leaders within the community. Um, in the 2019 Conservation Intern Program, um, I was a part of it. It helped me develop some community building and organizing skills and Paul helped me develop my uh, deep love of Park County's environment and its people. Um, so now I would like to welcome the incredible 2022 conservation interns. Um, Remy Sexton and Silas Schwartzberg are gonna be here and Scarlett Welch is unfortunately unable to join us, um, but I'll give her a hard time about it. Please welcome. Come on, come on. I gotta open it up, come on. Right. Hi, my name is Remy Sexton. I am a junior at Park High in Livingston, and I was a conservation leadership intern this summer. Um, the reason I wanted to be involved with PCEC is because it's just such a foundational part of our community. And I think what's really special about it is that it's hard to not be involved in PCEC and hard not to be impacted by it. And for me, it serves as a way to turn my passion and love for this place into meaningful action. Hi, I'm Silas Wurzberg. I'm also a junior at Park High School, and I also did the conservation leadership internship at uh, PCEC this past summer. Um, for me, PCEC was uh, my first job opportunity, and I think it really set me up well for future um, work, working, working scenarios. Um, I really look up to what P PCC does and uh, really appreciate what they do for the community. I think it's great and we need more, we need more support and get our job done. Thank you. Thank you so much, you guys. Um, you're both truly really wonderful uh, individuals and we're very lucky to have you in our community. Um, and it's super exciting announcement. I'm thrilled to announce that with the support of generous donors, we are able to, con to continue working with Miss Alicia Jongward, um, who if you don't know her, she was a huge mentor of mine in high school um, and supports the Green Initiative at Park High. Um, so with the help from the donors, we, that support will continue through the 2022-2023 school year um, and hopefully beyond. Um, for those of you who do not know Miss J, she is one of the most wonderful people I have ever met. Um, she fosters a community of care, solidarity, hope, and most importantly, action. Um, she's inspired and supported countless Park High students in finding and achieving their dreams, and it means the world to me and so many other students that she can continue to be a leader and mentor for climate action in Park County. Um, so it makes me really happy that she can continue to do this work. Um, but back to Michelle to wrap us up with some business. <laughs> Thank you, um, Adele. Alicia, do you just want to wave real quick and say hi? I know you're on, but uh, we, we, if you're there, wave and say hi. Um, I want to apologize. We're a little bit over, but I think we had just some really stellar presentations from community members there. Um, so Jonathan, if you could move us to the next slide, I'm gonna wrap us up. This is our financial summary. Um, and Wendy was uh, 
hoping to do this for us, but she has to go. Uh, it, Wendy, are you are you able to jump? She was in the car. So, so yeah. So I've switched to the car. Um, <laughs> I'm on my way to Chico to celebrate with my husband his birthday tonight. Um, so sorry that I can't be on my computer. But anyway, I just want to quickly say that um, I feel like PCEC is doing really well financially. We are so fortunate to have so many amazing um, supporters. And when I look at this budget from last year, um, what just blows my mind is where we've come. Because I think it's about eight years ago when, when um, Michelle joined where the budget was $20,000 a year. <laughs> and so when you look at these numbers right now, it's, it's pretty darn amazing. Um, on the next slide, it shows where we are this year and our projected income is um, higher than last year. We, we keep increasing year over year and, and, um, so, but we, and so we made an aggr aggressive goal for ourselves. And as you can see, um, our, the remaining amount that we need to um, bring in is 53,000, and which is our goal for the year's end uh, between now and January 1st. Uh, it's doable, and with your help tonight and for the rest of this year, um, please help us make that happen. Um, we can't do all of this uh, work without you, and of course, you're what makes that happen. So thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy. Can we get a quick update from the office on where we're at with our fundraising? All right, I hope everybody can see our beautiful um, thermometer. We are right at, right under the $4,000 mark right now. We actually have had them come in online. We just had a phone call. We've had some pledges come in over the chat line. So I really appreciate you guys um, supporting us tonight. As you've heard from our interns, your donations help support programs like that, the different programs that um, like Jeff was talking about, the flood relief. So thank you so much. And all of you who donate, I will be getting in contact with you and getting those goodies and those uh, calendars and mugs out to you. Okay, thank you, Robin. Um, I'm just gonna quickly share our highlight page here next, Jonathan. And then we'll wrap up with a toast. I'm not gonna go through our accomplishments. We sent these um, in letters, they're posted on our website. We've done a lot in 2022 and you've heard about that tonight. Uh, we also had some fun. The next slide just shows our Yellowstone Gateway 30K. Um, we hosted this race for the fourth year in a row. We had almost 200 racers, a huge number of volunteers go into this effort. It's getting people on the land and celebrating. Um, and then our next slide is our team, PCEC staff got on the land in the crazies this year. And we were able to, uh, Jonathan, can you move to the next one? We were able to hike across the crazies from sunlight all the way up sweet grass and out over here um, at Campfire Lake. There's gonna be a lot of work um, in the crazies coming down um, towards the end of the year here. So please reach out if you've got questions about what's happening there, what's happening on the land. We we spent a good amount of time over Labor Day weekend um, there together. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to say thank you to everybody and pass it to Adele to do a toast. We have a very generous match of $10,000, which is open for the next 24 hours. So if you weren't able to make a donation this, this evening, um, that, that match will stay open um, until the end of the day tomorrow. So we still have plenty of time to help us get there. Um, thank you for joining uh, to you, Adele, to, to close us out. Awesome, thanks, Michelle. Oh, the um, fishing trip. Oh, yeah, go. Oh, Jonathan just reminded me. We have a fishing trip to give away as well. So how about Adele, you could do your toast and that while well, Jonathan runs the raffle for who gets the fishing trip. Great, love. Um, awesome, so my toast uh, is to Park County Environmental Council, um, to Park County itself, and to all of you, of course. Um, I had a conversation on election day about how even if by some miracle all the elections result in everything we'd hoped, it still wouldn't be enough to stop climate change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I do agree. 
But I do know that in this room, the Zoom room, there are a bunch of people who care an awful lot about a really special place, Park County, Montana, Earth. I do think that you all hold an exceptional amount of power in this community and in this world. And with this power and with our care, we can make an active change for the better by supporting PCEC, by supporting our neighbors, and by giving back to the Park County community. Um, so cheers and well, pass it to Michelle for the fishing goal. Thank you, Adele. Okay, so drum roll. I do have a winner of the fishing trip. I also, um, I'm going to pause for one minute because Luis, I, I didn't see you earlier when we were doing our um, introductions. Is there any chance that we could just see a cute face of the newest uh, member of the PCEC community? Board member Luis Islas just welcomed his first daughter, Mary Soul. She's probably sleeping, but in case she's in the background there, we'd love to peek at her cute face. I can, I can grab little Mighty Soul here in a little bit. I'll bring her up to the camera. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Just a little pause there. Here is the winner. And I apologize because I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to say this name right. Um, is it Cammie Anderson? Shammy. Uh, Shammy. Yeah. Congratulations. Shammy. <laughs> <laughs> so excited i love this organization i've been here for about a year and a half i work for D defenders of wildlife and wildlife recovery i i think there's a lot of synergies i can bring to this organization um my family is also involved with the madison river foundation and uh i, I i'm going to donate tonight and i'm really excited to be a part of this community and a part of this organization and I thought this meeting was amazing and you guys are awesome and hats off. I'm so proud to be a part of you and it's just really exciting. Good, good stuff. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Shami. We can't wait to meet you. Um, we'll, we'll make sure and connect, pass off the award and learn more about all the great work and potential opportunities to collaborate. Um, so we have officially ended our program. I want to thank everybody. I, I was really anxious we were going to go over time because we had such excellent content, but I think that that was uh, really inspiring. So thank you to all the volunteers, uh, for all the community members and staff who showed up and told a real heartful story about what it means to do conservation in community. I feel inspired. So I'm, I'm really glad to be here with you all tonight. Um, and, and we did say we would keep the Zoom open if folks wanna stay on and say hello to Mary Soul, um, say hello to a neighbor, um, you know, grab a glass of wine or a, uh, a glass of water and, and um, say hello to one another. So please continue to hang out if you want or um, uh, get to dinner. For, uh, or envy Colin and Sebring in Hawaii right now. While we're sitting, yeah, aloha, fuckers. <laughs> Is that cold? That's amazing. <laughs> we love you guys. Thank you for everything you've done for the community, PCEC, and congratulations. We love you too, even though you're mean to us, evidently. <laughs> That's me. We believe in hard love at PCEC. Sometimes we have to push a little. That's okay. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, everybody. Good program. Love PCEC. Good night. Thanks, Joe. For everyone just still listening, I'm going to put another plug. There's so much more room to share stories and connect. Um, so just December 8th, at 5 p.m. at the Gateway Yellowstone Museum, we're going PCEC staff and board are going to cook a potluck style meal and drinks, and you're all invited. And it's a place where it's more casual. We don't have to do financial reports, um, and we can just be in community with one another over food, like the old school days. So we hope you'll join us, and you'll get lots of communications about more of those details. Um, so yes. Hi night, everybody. It's great seeing you. Thank you for everything you do.